Welcome everyone to this webinar on small group instruction and ways that small groups can transform classrooms into dynamic student-centered learning environments. My name is Joey Pearson and I am thrilled to be here with you on behalf of Moreland University where our mission is teaching teachers around the world to be resourceful problem solvers and tech savvy educators through an online collaborative activity-based learning system designed for tomorrow's students in a dynamic and diverse world. Here at Moreland, we are proud to offer our flagship Teach Now teacher preparation certificate program through which educators around the world can go on to earn a teaching certificate in as few as nine months. In addition, we support educators throughout the lifetime of their careers by offering master's degrees in education. Hi everyone, my name is Leah Stramp. I am alumni from Moreland University as well as an instructor with Moreland University. Um, but by day, I also work at a K through 12 as an ESL teacher, where we focus a lot on small group intervention, um, both inside the general education classroom and in a pullout structure as well. Hi everyone, my name is Melissa Collins and I've been with Moreland for about four years now. Um, I was a special education teacher for a number of years in the public schools um, here in West Virginia. And um, I use small group instruction a lot in my classroom um, to really help manage the different levels of students in my classroom and make sure that everyone was supported. Folks, my name is Joey and I am a faculty member as well here at Moreland University who has stepped into an administrative role leading and supporting our community building efforts. I work to ensure that our community of candidates and alumni, instructors and staff members are all engaged and supported as we move forward toward the mission of enabling and empowering as many teachers as we can to serve the students who need them the most around the world. The question that we're really trying to answer through our work to get together today in this webinar is how can teachers effectively facilitate learning when students are working on multiple unique tasks simultaneously around the classroom through small group instruction? Today, we will discuss ways to plan small groups and to manage the classroom safely and successfully. We're going to share how each of us have innovated the classroom and transform learning through well-managed small groups. What are some examples of effective small group learning activities that you've used and how did they impact learning in your classroom? In responding, I want us each to consider and to talk about differentiation, extension, cooperative learning, and other types of activities that we've used in small groups. Leah, take it away. Um, I, I've seen it done very effectively, very differently at different age groups. Um, having the privilege of working with K through 12 students at my school, um, I see a lot of effective kindergarten teachers using stations where students have different activities at different tables and then is able to meet one on one to uh, gauge and assess uh, early literacy with kindergartners. And that's been really great, especially for targeting learners that need additional support and determining intervention early on. Um, it also helps with teachers being able to get to know the students more because they have that one on one time as they rotate through the teachers table and then the other different activities. Um, in an older model, actually, I am very fond of more heterogeneous grouping, groupings uh, where students are kind of mixed in their abilities and uh, performing tasks, maybe like a research project or something. But what's special about those is that if students are given roles within those groups, um, it really helps them to kind of really work together, collaborate as peers, foster positive peer relationships, and then achieve something together. And that I've seen be really effective and great for building a sense of community. Melissa, what are your thoughts on this first question to sort of set the stage for the rest of our discussion on some examples of effective small group learning activities you've used? So um, to kind of piggyback off of um, what Leah said about the stations, um, I use that a lot. Um, with my students, I did teach high school. However, I had a variety of levels in my classroom. Um, and to ensure that everyone 
you know, was getting the support that they needed. Um, you know, we would do stations, we would rotate through. Um, and oftentimes I would also kind of mix the groups up if we were doing the research project, like Leah mentioned, like we, you know, I would make sure that each student had, um, you know, somebody like a peer buddy, at least who, you know, was working on a different level to kind of help support them. Um, and also it was kind of a way to enrich and extend the content for the uh, learner who was maybe more of a higher achiever um, because they were able to kind of think about ways to explain the content to the student who needed more support. Um, so I did a lot of that as well. Uh, we also did where we would kind of have the students work in just kind of small groups um, on their level. Um, and, you know, we would be able to go around and target um, specific skills that they need to be working on. So kind of a mix of everything. <laughs> right. Well, I want to challenge us for the purpose of this webinar to pause and identify one example. And I want that to be a transformative example that we can use to inspire those who are with us in this session and those who uh, may be watching the recording afterward as a part of our community. And I think I'll go first. So when I have used small group instruction, it has been because it was the only way that I could effectively create a learning environment that met the needs of the diverse learners in my classroom. And in uh, Vista, California, 70% of my students came from backgrounds where they spoke Spanish at home. And yet they all had different levels of Spanish in terms of their ability to read it and write it, speak and understand it. And yet 30% of the students um, who came into my classroom did not speak any Spanish at all because they came from backgrounds that maybe um, sort of focused on uh, different languages at home being English, um, Tagalog, and uh, a variety of other languages that came in my community. The transformative small group um, structure that really impacted learning in my classroom was guided reading groups. Through guided reading groups, I was able to create a space where every single learner was placed into a homogeneous group with other learners of a similar level. And for very specific moments, meaning not all the time, just sometimes, they would meet in those groups to receive the targeted instruction and support that they needed with me as the teacher leading in that teacher guided small group. I would meet, meet with those groups maybe once or twice a week um, to provide feedback, <clears throat> guidance, and instruction that really set those students off um, on a path of, of self-awareness about the, the level that they were, linguistically speaking, and the ways that they could seek additional support and practice in a variety of activities that were in mixed groups. Because for me, mixed groups were really the place where community was built and where the most fun happened when students of a variety of backgrounds came together to practice Spanish and learn and grow. But the, the, the groups that transformed my classroom were those homogeneous small group reading opportunities where we would, with students on a similar level of Spanish language ability, come together to read, to write, to practice speaking, and to practice hearing and understanding one another in very limited contexts so that every student had that touch point with me at least once or twice a week to receive the support that he or she or they deserved. Leah, what is the one transformative example that you could you could share? And I know I'm putting you on the spot. No worries. Although I feel like you stole my favorite one is guided reading in homogenous groups. Definitely extremely effective, especially in those elementary years. I think homogenous grouping when you're learning those foundational skills is is absolutely effective with um, personalizing learning for all of them and then pushing each learner to their to be to meet their full potential. Um, I guess one, I'm going to come up, I'm going to share one that is great, especially in an online learning environment, is um, breakout rooms with web quests. I find those to be really effective in, um, in a heterogeneous group, especially, um, because then you can, again, assign roles to different learners in the group and then have some um, leaving more information on the document, one being the head researcher and one making sure that everybody in the group is collaborating and staying on task. Um, that's been really effective and definitely helps students with different talents to shine. Web quests are fun too. 
and I'm happy to share any resources for those. If right. I was going to say, could you put it in the chat space so that we could take a look? And I want to just share that um, when we do those small group reading interventions that we both are fans of, you can also do those using WebQuest in breakout rooms in Zoom because, or in whatever platform that you're using, because we can recreate sort of that individualized small group instruction through breakout rooms and online environments. But I do love mixing the groups up to do um, projects across reading levels and ability levels through cooperative tasks like that. Leah, thanks for sharing. Melissa, what are your thoughts? That was actually one of my favorite ones too. <laughs> it's actually mixing up the different ability levels. Um, but I will say my um, homogenous groups were great, um, you know, where I was able to really kind of have my students all in one group based on their ability level. Um, you know, what we would usually do is, you know, I had an aide in my classroom, but this could work, you know, with just one teacher as well. Um, I would have a group who, um, you know, could work independently for the day, um, and it would be something on their level they could do independently. I would work with one group um, for that particular day. Um, my aide would work with another. Um, however, you could, you know, split it, um, you know, split your class and have one group that works independently or, you know, one group, you know, that works with the teacher. Um, and it was neat because I got to rotate through the groups um, throughout the week and I could have that time with them and really target what they needed and give them the support to be able to then, you know, continue to work independently on the other days of the of the week. So that was that was a favorite as well. Um, something I did quite often. Yeah. We've given now a number of examples of small group configurations and activities that you can use in the classroom, both in person and online. And as you are researching, I encourage you, um, those of you who are watching and, and participating today, to look at the diversity of ways that small groups are used in your grade level or subject area. And if you came to this particular webinar through the Moreland community, then you likely have already downloaded our small group graphic organizer, where you'll see, I believe there are six different small group configurations available to plan as a result of that graphic organizer. And if you don't yet have it, make sure that you comment on the video below, or if you are here, put in the chat space, please send me the graphic organizer and we'll make sure that you get it because that is sort of the, the, the resource that'll help you to envision how you can take and apply small groups in your classroom. But I'd like to transition now to the second question, which really builds and talks about assessment. So our second question is, <clears throat> how have you been able to assess small group learning to ensure students participate and learn? What practices have you learned to incorporate and avoid to promote student success in small groups? And um, Leah and Melissa, I just want to share with you that a lot of the participants have indicated that they are um, excited to use small groups, but they're just not sure how to assess student work and to ensure that students are in fact participating when each student and each group is working independently and collaboratively um, around the room. I know that sounded ironic. Let me rephrase that. Each group is working autonomously around the room without the teacher being a direct observer. So I'll put this in the chat space. And uh, Melissa, would you like to start us off for this? And I see that I'm going to have to send out a lot of graphic organizers right now. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So um, a big thing that I used to do um, whenever I would you know, have my projects that I had going is I would assign jobs to students. Um, you know, for example, if my students were working on a research project, one student would be kind of my, um, you know, main researcher. Um, somebody else would kind of make the presentation really nice and um, engaging. And then somebody else might be my presenter. Somebody else might be the recorder. Um, <clears throat> and in doing so, I was able to make sure that, you know, the students had jobs that were really kind of best suited for them, but also it held them accountable. Um, you know, if, the project was not um, very well put together as visually Then I knew that my person who was responsible for the visuals probably didn't do their job or, um, you know, if the presentation itself, you know, was kind of, um, you know, not, not, not very well stated that I knew, you know, okay, well, they probably didn't pull their weight. And it was really easy for me to assess who was doing what by just assigning jobs. 
and that could work really in any type of grouping, um, you know, to assign jobs to every student so that way you know who's doing what and you can kind of check on what they're doing. That cooperative strategy whereby every individual is responsible for a task that contributes to the whole. Uh, Leah, what are your thoughts? How have you been able to assess small group learning? Uh, to bounce off of what Melissa said, definitely with those heterogeneous groups where you're creating different roles for different activities, um, I think rubrics are great for that. Um, kind of along the lines of what Melissa was saying, being very clear in what those roles look like and making sure that you kind of, that you have um, just a guide of what, what those learners are supposed to do in their time. And then a rubric could be really great for that. Um, in more of the homogenous groups though, where maybe different students are working on different tasks at one time, um, I feel like what I try and do with those is I really have like one area where assessment is necessary. And then the rest of the stations are usually um, more for practice. Um, for like individual practice or even a little bit of fun, why not? Um, as they rotate around and then as they get to the station where you're assessing it, you actually get more one-on-one -on -one time. And for those, I'm a huge fan of checklists. Um, like, you know, it could be, if we're uh, looking at early literacy, it might be like letters and letter sounds. And then you check through if the ones that they're reading well or the ones that they still need help with. That way you have data for each and every student. Uh, but even if you wanted to walk around and assess things that are going on in every group simultaneously, checklists can be really good for that as well. You just want to have a clear idea of what you're assessing um, before you launch the activity. Well, to, to really build off of what Leah and Melissa have said, I'd like to talk about a very specific rubric that I used in my classroom, which was the um, participation rubric. And this was a way that I could create an awareness among all of us uh, regarding what participation looked like. The rubric was a half piece of paper and there was a stack of them at the front of my room. And that rubric was available to me as well as to my students to self-assess or to provide an assessment um, of one another regarding the participation that was going on in each small group. So at the start of the small groups, I would grab one of those rubrics, one of those half sheets of paper that was sort of a checklist, sort of a guide, sort of a overall um, description of what effective participation looked like. And I would re review it verbally with the class every single time we did small groups to ensure we were all clear on the expectations. Then randomly throughout the day, I would grab one, grab a clipboard and do an assessment of a student or a group. But here was the trick. I would sit on one half of the class or one side of the classroom and assess a student or a group of students on the other side of the classroom because I could pay attention to what was happening across the room without needing to be right there. It wasn't a gotcha moment and there was no moment of sort of overbearing teacher presence. It was rather an opportunity for me to sit and to quietly observe and to give feedback so that students would know what I'm observing and then could reflect on how they might improve or continue to do the good work that they're doing. Then at the end of small groups, I would pass out the same rubric to every student who would self-assess and on the back of that document, write a reflection on how they think they did. And that would be submitted to me and I could look through them really quickly. And the trick is I knew who was participating and who was not as Melissa alluded to. And so I could quickly target within those reflections, the students who needed the additional support, grab those reflections, read them, see if the students are really being authentic and saying, you know, I didn't do as well as I could have, or if they are simply misguided and, and need some more understanding of what active participation looks like so that I could provide them with the additional support in terms of participation. Let's also talk about learning assessment and assessment of students' abilities and knowledge. How have you been able to use small groups to assess students in their abilities and their knowledge within the context of the subject area or the grade level that you taught? Melissa, would you like to take this one? 
Sure. Um, absolutely. So well, in my class, you know, with the homogenous groups where I would kind of work with um, the students, you know, different days, um, I would use those days not only to work with the students, but also to assess where they were um, and see exactly where I needed to support each student. So, um, you know, I might have one group come through and, you know, we're all working on one particular activity and I'm seeing that the student over here is kind of just struggling with one particular aspect. I know, okay, well, maybe I need to, um, you know, kind of prepare, you know, when we do our independent work time, prepare something that I can really use to help, um, you know, reteach, or um, maybe I can try to pull, pull the student aside for a one-on-one, -on -one, um, you know, while the students are going through stations, and I can really kind of help support them that way. Um, so I kind of used my time with them as, you know, um, kind of did double duty, I guess, you know, I was working with them, but I was also kind of assessing them as I worked with them. So I was using kind of their classwork, um, and my observation as a way to formatively assess where they were at that point in time. I always had a notepad or a rubric or some lever of assessment in my hands as I would be walking around and working with students. Um, and in some cases, each of the small groups, in fact, would have a rubric related to a standard. So in my classroom, we might have um, a standard related to speaking and being able to say what you like. If that were the goal of that small group, then I would likely have a rubric related to that, a very simple one that says, you know, yes, I can hit this skill. I'm approaching being able to hit the skill. I'm not able to hit the skill or I didn't try and use that as a way to assess students' abilities in that small group or to have them self-assess in terms of their abilities within that small group. And Leah, what are your thoughts on, on assessing specific skills and content? Um, well, with those foundational skills, again, like early literacy or those uh, foundational math skills, I'm a big fan of diagnostic assessments, just one-on-one uh, -on -one to just see where students are at and then kind of gauge my homogenous groups that way. Um, but for, more advanced topics, let's, let's say you're teaching fifth grade science where it's not so much those foundational skills. I think a pre-assessment at the beginning of every unit is a really good way to gauge what learners need. Um, because sometimes you have a student that maybe uh, struggles, typically struggles in your class, but then you get into your unit on the water cycle and they are a rock star. So then you need to rethink the way that you plan your groups for that unit. Talk about planning groups, because that is a practice I think that could help uh, clarify how to structure small groups for some, some of our folks watching today. Um, so again, my, pro my process for planning usually is based off of those pre-assessments or those diagnostic assessments. And um, depending on the size of the classroom that you're working with, you might want to go with anywhere between three and six groups. I try and keep my small groups um, between four and six students, typically, because I feel like that's kind of the perfect number to build a sense of community and not have um, an overflow of, of people where there's not enough jobs for everybody and somebody is not really pulling their own weight. So I think four to six is kind of that magic number. With the lower, uh, with the struggling students, I try and put them in smaller groups though. That way uh, there's, there's really just a lot more one-on-one -on -one focus when you get that time with them. Um, <clears throat> but so that's how I plan it with uh, four to six students at a time. And then based on the diagnostic or pre-assessments, so my high flyers would be grouped together when I'm doing homogenous and my, my struggling learners will stick together. Um, and a lot of times I find that as an ESL teacher, I noticed this one particularly, my language learners almost always end up in that lower caliber, not because they struggle with the ability to learn in general, but they don't have solid mastery of the language of instruction. And so then that also gives you kind of an idea of what kind of differentiation you need to include for those groups as well. So you use the pre-assessments to determine the levels of your students, and then you group them appropriately. Correct. Have you ever considered, and this goes to you, Leah, or you, Melissa, grouping students based on interest or a topic that they are passionate about so that they can collaborate and work together on 
an activity through the lens of that topic. Let's say, for instance, the thing that's coming to mind is race cars or horses or astronomy or um, ocean, o oceanography, something in a classroom that may not be related directly to the topic because you're in a math class or an ESL class or a Spanish class, but that can inspire and motivate students to work hard. Have you all done any, any work with that, Melissa? Yes, um, so my students, um, a lot of them really had quite um, you know, direct and distinct <laughs> interests. Um, and so I, you know, I was able to kind of group them. Um, you know, I had some students who were really obsessed with um, like monster trucks um, and going to like the monster truck shows. And so um, you know, I was able to kind of group them together. We worked on, um, they were making posters. Um, actually it was my daily living class and we were making um, like daily hygiene posters. <laughs> um, so, I mean, it seems like it's totally unrelated, but I told them that they could use like their interest to kind of make the posters interesting. So, um, you know, they, they made a poster on like, like brushing your teeth, but they had the monster trucks incorporated in it. Um, and, you know, it, it, wouldn't have normally made sense to anybody else, but it really worked for them. They got motivated because they're like, oh my gosh, like I can put monster trucks in this toothbrushing poster. Um, and so, yeah, we did a lot of that, um, especially because they were so hyper-focused on their, their interests that we were, it, it really worked well. What are your thoughts, Leah? Uh, the one that comes to mind most recently in a ninth grade science class that I push into we did an interest-based grouping on biomes. So each student had to create a 3D biome on um, online using this really cool app. I'm gonna have to get the name of it for you. But based on your interest, you could be in an aquatic biome or the rainforest um, or any habitat that you liked. And some of them were more popular than others. So we had, I think, two separate groups that were focused on the rainforest, but then other people got to choose the other um, habitats that they liked, their interests. Some other topics that are coming to mind in addition to Leo, what you've shared and Melissa are um, sort of affinity groups around pop culture. So uh, I know when I was a teacher uh, in Vista, California, as I mentioned, a lot of my students loved K-pop. And so if ever I were, oh my word, as soon as I said that, somebody in the chat space just said K-pop. So that is exactly what I would do with my students. We would we would have different groups um, based on uh, popular culture and interests there. Um, <clears throat> we also would have groups based on sports that they enjoyed playing and those who did not enjoy sports at all, which was totally fine. Um, but creating space for students to express their interests and have their voices heard was critical. What about some ways that we can think about enhancing students' skills, in particular those students who may have lower achievements on academic skills, but higher abilities in other areas. So I would like to give an example and then pass it back to the team. I had students who had IEPs, but whose artistic abilities surpassed almost anyone I've ever met in my life. Students who could paint in beautiful ways, who could sing, who could play instruments, um, who could sculpt, who could build, but yet struggled with learning a second language. And so I would create group opportunities wherein students could express themselves artistically and demonstrate how fabulously talented they were in one way, shape or another, while also engaging with the language or in the case of any teacher, the subject matter that we're teaching. So what have been some activities or ways that you've been able to integrate art and an arts integrated approach or a technology integrated approach or an other skill integrated approach to allow students to work in small groups to demonstrate their learning. Because remember, we're still talking about assessment in small groups at this time. Leo, would you like to take this one or Melissa? I'll, uh, I see you're both nodding. So I know that we're all sort of like, yes, we have this. Leo, why don't you take this one first and then sure. we'll go to Melissa. 
Uh, this reminds me of a seventh grade science class that I push into every week as well. Um, and one really cool thing that I see in that one is at the end of each module that they cover, at the end there's a final project and the outputs are, there's a variety of different output options. And I think having a diverse realm of output options is really great for allowing students to shine with the talents that they have rather than forcing them to do some specific thing. Um, and in that class, there are students that put together fabulous slideshows of their understanding. So I'll get specific here. Um, the most recent one that we did covered um, the three of Newton's laws. And so at the end of that module, you had to demonstrate your knowledge of all three of those um, somehow. And then so some students, my, my ELLs in that class, they both opted for the comic strip option. They both drew and colored and and created visuals for um, demonstrating those laws. And then other students in the class actually built structures. And then some other students in the class, I think there was one that built um, a roller coaster that was able to demonstrate all three. And then a few others went and created stuff virtually. And so the, the output options really made for very exciting projects for all of the learners, as well as the teacher that had to grade and look at them all because the students were really proud of what they had accomplished. Melissa? Well, all of my students had IEPs. Um, and so, you know, I saw a lot of, um, you know, maybe academically they were, again, I had high school. That was the you know last school where I taught. They were high schoolers, nine through 12 um, grades. But their actual reading levels, um, because I primarily taught reading, were anywhere from preschool to maybe seventh grade at the most. Um, so there was definitely a deficit there. However, a lot of them did have a lot of talents. Um, you know, there were quite a few who could draw and it just would amaze me. Um, they would just draw me things and I'm like, whoa. <laughs> um, and I, I thought of one student in particular, um, when I first got to the school, he was a 10th grader, I believe. Um, and he would just come in the classroom, stick his head in his backpack and go to sleep. That's what he would do every class every day. And I noticed there was one rare occasion where he was just drawing. Um, and I was like, oh my goodness. And so I took that, and, you know, a, a lot of times I would assess and want to really target their research ability, um, you know, because they were graduating and I wanted them to be able to at least find basic information. Um, so we would work on little research projects to really kind of address that. And, um, for his and like for several of the other students who really were very you know artistically inclined, I would allow them to kind of draw what they found. Um, you know, so if we were researching, um, uh, you know, I think we did like President's Day, like we talked about presidents because they didn't really know why we, you know there was a President's Day, um, and so I was like, okay, you know, we're researching, you know, draw me a president, you know, that you found and, you know, tell me about this president. Um, and so they were able to draw the president and then tell me who it was when they were president. And, and those were the research skills that I was wanting them to really work on. Um, but, you know, they were able to really use their talent to bring that out. Um, so that was something that I did a lot of in my class with the little research projects. I love that. And I think I'll add, in addition to what I saw Eric Baptiste in the chat space share, students are assessed on the visuals they use for presentations. One student who is developing her language skills consistently has the best design visuals on her presentation. It's crazy. When we lean into the talents and skills and the abilities of our students, we learn and discover so much about them as humans. And we can tap into an internal sense of motivation um, that will lead them to grow exponentially as learners. Um, in my classroom, I'll just share very briefly that when I allowed students to have choice, and this connects to what we talked about a couple months ago here at Moreland University in our community sharing focus on student choice and student voice in the classroom, when I allowed them the opportunity to choose how they express themselves and to demonstrate what they knew in a, in a means through a means or method that was uh, uniquely interesting and important to them as individuals, I saw that they were able to engage deeply and demonstrate a higher level of um, ability because they owned that product 
And when I say product, I mean assessment or evaluation. It's the, it's the end results of what they're doing, the product of their learning. So as much as I could, I would integrate choice. Let's wrap up question number two, Leah and Melissa, with two to three concrete best practices for assessment in small groups. And this is for those who are watching. I know we've been talking a lot. I want to give everyone a moment here to just take away a couple of gems from this by identifying each of us two to three best practices. So if you're watching and want to note this, this is the thing to note. Um, Leah, would you like to take this one first and then Melissa and then I'll go last. I feel like the three best practice practices are things that we've already mentioned. So I'd say checklists, rubrics, and multiple output activities. I'll, I'll go next. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I definitely have to, you know, agree with the rubrics, uh, making sure you have, you know, concrete, um, you know, what are you looking for? What do you expect from the students? Make sure that you know that as well. Um, student choice. I mean, that's something I really am always talking <laughs> about with my, um, with my candidates is allowing that student choice, um, you know, and just really being observant, um, you know, just picking up on the little things, you know, uh, working with your students, taking that time to work with the groups and observe. Um, I think that's my, my key points there. And then mine will be, shared expectations, number one, all students should understand the expectations of their work and have access to any checklists or rubrics in advance so that they can be aware of what they're working toward. And then second, I would say student interest and motivation is key. So when assessing students, try as hard as you can to integrate student voice and choice, as Melissa said, so that they have a, an opportunity to engage with something that's personally relevant and meaningful for them. So what we're gonna do now is transition to our last question, which uh, connects to actually what um, we've just seen in the chat space from Rodney Jeffries about um, managing small groups. So our last question simply is, what concrete strategies can you share to manage the classroom when using small group instruction? This is important because if you can't manage the classroom, then you can't really use this strategy. And I've put this into the chat space for everyone. And uh, Melissa, would you like to start for us for this one? Sure. Um, so with uh, my students, I, um, you know, always made sure that, you know, if I was working with one group in particular, that my other groups had something that was appropriate, appropriate and engaging. Um, you know, I would kind of tap into their interests. A lot of times, um, you know, before I got really going in a class, I would do some type of icebreaker or some type of survey. So I could get to know the students and what they were interested in and, you know, kind of where they were at. And then I could plan activities that they could do independently based on that. And that's what I would kind of have them working on, um, you know, while I was working with my other groups. I always had a stack of just work. Um, and it wasn't like, you know, anything that was like, you know, too difficult or not fun. You know, it was things like word searches, you know, different, um, you know, coloring, you know, Paper, just different, different things like that so that if the students who are working independently did finish their work before I was finished with my group they had something to go and do um eliminating that downtime is so crucial um you know when you have that downtime and the students if you're if you're managing one group and you have another group who's working independently if they have that downtime that's when you start to have issues um and so making sure that you eliminate that downtime is the biggest piece of advice I can give I agree. I think having a really strong classroom management established up front um, is going to be essential. You know, make sure that you cover all of your bases. You could have um, a noise monitoring app on your board if you have a smart board. I'm a big fan of bouncyballs.com or .org, actually. Um, it's cute. It bounces around if students get too loud. You have to let them try it loud one time. That way they can get another system. But then after that, um, you know, there could be there could be um, a consequence for groups that get too loud, maybe um, 
maybe they lose five minutes of free time at the end or two minutes of free time, depending on the age group of your students. Um, but things like that, like using apps or having an effective timer or really mastering those transitions from activity to activity can really help tighten up what those groups look like when they're in action. Routines and procedures are also critical for effective small group instruction um, to work and to flow in the classroom. And so part of the way that I created small groups for student success was to establish routines and procedures that would begin and end our small group successfully. Um, I might, at the beginning of a small group, establish the expectation through an objective or um, establish a time for people to be silent and read instructions and get themselves oriented, and then lead into a period of 10 to 12 minutes for students to work. And then finally, a two to three minute wrap up and clean up period. Um, the way I would do that without having to strain my voice is using a bell in my classroom so that when I hit the bell twice, students would know that we're getting close to that ending period and, and using the timer that was mentioned, students would know that they have three minutes to clean up and by the time the, the timer hit zero to be silent. So with that being said, what routines and procedures Leah, ha have you found to be effective in your classroom for small groups? Um, we have a very solid small group entry routine, as well as expectations for um, respect amongst the learners during the group work. And then another, as you said, sort of wrap up routine um, that ends the group work, or at least ends the station, depending on which one they're doing. Uh, looks like Delmay in the chat box noted modeling, and I think that that's a really good example as well. Um, I'm a huge fan of positive modeling to help maintain that positive um, environment when you're managing the classroom. For example, if I see that group three is being a little bit rowdy, I might walk around and say group one is being a wonderful example. I can see they're speaking at a level one right now, and everyone is seated in their, seat, seated in their seats, um, and then that might help to not only reinforce what they're doing, but remind the other students of what they need to be doing. Melissa, what are some procedures or routines that have been transformative for small group instruction in your classroom? Yes, yeah, so um, I used a lot of visuals. Um, I would use like the visual timers. Um, you know, sometimes I would use a visual cue um, for them to get, know that if we were like maybe doing stations for that day that they would know to rotate to another station. Um, we had a solid routine where my students would come into the classroom. They knew that they had to do the bell ringer. It was always, you know, get your pencil, your paper, sit, do the bell ringer. And then they would know from there, once that was finished, to start getting into their groups. Um, and so, you know, I would always give a cue, even though they knew. Um, to get into the groups. Um, I would occasionally reiterate the expectations. Um, I tried to at least go over them once a week after the students learned them just because I wanted to make sure they stuck in their minds. Um, I knew that if I came back from breaks, we would have to spend a couple of days relearning. Um, but really just visuals was a big thing um, and, and just visual cues. That was something that my students really responded well to. Um, we, we did, you know, my, my classroom could get a little noisy. <laughs> I mean, it was just something that happened with my students. Um, so, you know, we did have to kind of work on, like I did the modeling, um, as Leah mentioned, you know, I would kind of have to work, you know, oh, this group is, you know, um, and everybody wanted to, of course, do what the group that was praised was doing. Um, so I did use that a lot as well. But the main thing was a lot of visuals. <laughs> uh, my students really thrived on that. Well, practicing, right? and allowing opportunities for practice in my classroom of the right way to do things and the wrong way to do, to do things. So we would in fact have opportunities to um, transition incorrectly, right? And I would say, okay, we're gonna do this wrong and look at why it's wrong. And so either I would do something incorrectly or I would ask a student to transition incorrectly. And then we would laugh about it, talk about what was incorrect and how we would do it differently. 
and in so doing, create some joy in the classroom, some fun, but also extreme amounts of clarity around what is expected. Um, I think also having access to all of the materials and knowing how to get those materials is key. We often assume that students can just be told, you know, the markers are here and the scissors are there and the paper is there and the laptops are there and expect them to just be able to self-regulate and manage themselves in, in obtaining those materials. But it's important to have a procedure set up so that students understand that they are to treat themselves, their classmates, and the class materials with respect and use those things wisely and then put them back. Having opportunities to practice doing that as well would help. What about some things to avoid? I know we've talked about a lot of routines and procedures and management strategies that have worked. Can you share one, Leah, that you've tried or that you've learned really just doesn't work very well for small groups in your classroom? I know this is sort of putting you on the spot, but I'm sure we can all think of something that did not work well. Um, I think not being totally intentional with the space and trying to kind of fly by the seat of your pants when you're doing this is a is a big way to fail. Um, sometimes if you're like, oh, okay, group one, you guys just go hang out in that back corner. They like start looking around. They're like, which back corner is she talking about? This lady's crazy. And then, you know, it takes a minute for them to figure out where they need to go. So being really intentional, not just like with the stuff, like you mentioned, like making sure that students know where to get it. They know how to put it back. They know what the proper use of it. I think that qualifies to space in the classroom as well. So if you have um, dedicated seating arrangements for our groups. Like you might have students arranged in their groups the way they come in, you maybe different tables or different desks, but then you also have a very um, well thought out strategy for how they're grouped together and how that looks in the space. Like, do they need to quickly move desks into a new table arrangement? Do they um, get up and move to different tables? How does that look? How do you use the space effectively? Melissa, what is something that you could help our, our, our participants sort of see and avoid? I think back to my first year as a teacher. <laughs> um, and the biggest thing that I did that was not effective was to create too many rules, um, too many things for the students to remember as far as routines, procedures, and that sort of thing. And so, um, you know, just scaling that down and making sure that you have like maybe three to five concrete you know, rules and, and procedures you know, when it comes to the groups. Um, that is definitely something I, I learned my lesson <laughs> very quickly with that. Um, but also, you know, and I mentioned this before, but, um, you know, just having too much, you know, downtime, um, I see in the chat that, um, you know, too many transitions and to kind of piggyback off that too much time in a transition can be problematic as well. Um, so making sure that you limit those transitions, um, you know, don't have too many of them and keep those rules and procedures to a minimum. And practice, 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 right? Practice makes permanent. I cannot under, um, what's the word? I, I, I can't stress enough how important it is, even with high school students, to practice these different routines and procedures for they form the basis of managing small group instruction, having an understanding of the way to do things correctly. And then I would say as another piece of the puzzle, having um, a list of consequences should those routines and procedures not be met. In my classroom, when we talked about consequences, it was really about natural consequences. So for instance, if you wasted time and an incorrect procedure and were given opportunities to correct it, but were not really using your time well, then you would make up that time and maybe coming in at a different part of the day during lunch or break or after school to get the work done that was not able to, to be gotten done. Um, if something, you know, if it was demonstrated through your actions that you weren't able to work independently or in your collaborative group, then you might be limited in the amount that you can work in uh, sort of choice activities or artistic activities until you can model and demonstrate your ability to rise to the occasion 
all of these were natural consequences that students were aware of so that they would know that they would get the support they needed. All of them were designed not only to teach and help them be successful, but also um, to teach them the skills that they needed to be successful outside of just the learning that took place. How do you successfully collaborate? How do you use time wisely? And lastly, I would say the norms of my classroom were also the norms of my small groups. They were to use time wisely, make good decisions, and to show respect. And so we would follow those three in our small groups as well. As we are coming to the end of our time together, I'd like us to um, think of any parting words for those of us who are thinking about trying small groups sometime in the next few weeks. Where can we start? What's the first thing that we can do if we're gonna just dive into this and bring small groups into our classroom um, for the first time? Melissa, would you like to, to go first? Sure. Um, so I, you know, basically, First and foremost, would say, don't be afraid to try. <laughs> um, it really is such a beneficial way for students to learn. Um, you know, something that I would just start with, you know, if this is new, your students aren't really used to it, maybe try to, um, you know, incorporate student choice right away, um, those interest groups. Start there, you know, get them engaged and buy in to, you know, the small grouping and um, get them used to it that way. That would be my my advice for a place to start. Um, and of course, make sure you do have those, um, you know, transitions and everything planned, um, plan, plan, plan before you get started as well. So that way you don't have um, any issues that might sidetrack you. I like that. Um, I think also starting with something simple, you know, it, you don't have to invent something totally new and complicated on the first try. You can go on some incredible app like Teachers Pay Teachers and find some activities that have been really successful in small groups before. Try out some of those and then maybe expand from there. And then mine would be simply to start by developing a rubric. I think the very first step to effectively organizing and managing small groups is to create a rubric that explains the expectations of participation in small group instruction. And that rubric can be the groundwork for designing activities and procedures and norms that will allow students to be successful in this small group environment. Well, thank you so much, Leah and Melissa for being with us today. It's really been fun to, to be part of this group with the two of you and to connect for those of you who are with us in person, thank you also for taking time out of your day, wherever you are in the world and whatever time it may be. I ask that if you benefited from the information and the strategies that you share, share, share this webinar with others, you're going to receive a recording and I encourage you to share what you've learned and the recording with your colleagues and networks via email and social media because knowledge is power. So let's share the wealth. For those interested in deepening and understanding of these best practices and more in effective teaching and learning, I encourage you to look into Moreland's teacher preparation program, or if you've already gone through that program, to look at the master's degrees in education, for there is so much opportunity to, de to develop and expand your ability to lead small groups through the programs here at Moreland University. On behalf of Moreland University, on behalf of the faculty members, the staff members, and the more than 6,000 teachers who have gone through our program. Thank you so much for being with us today, and I hope you have a fabulous rest of your week. Bye-bye, everyone.